Well, welcome back to Bible study. Uh, we're jumping into uh, the book of Revelation. Um, and so let me just do a couple things right up front um, as far as understanding this book. Uh, one, the title of the book is Revelation, not Revelations. And it's kind of a pet peeve of mine when people talk about the book of Revelation and put an S on the end of it. That's not multiple revelations. It's one singular revelation. And so first, let's just be clear about that. It was written by John, the uh, uh, the disciple John. The Bible says, whom Jesus loved. Uh, he's about 90 years old at the time, and he was writing it from um, basically a prison island called Patmos. Um, Domitian was the, the Roman emperor at the time that, towards the end of Domitian's reign, uh, really started to persecute Christians. Uh, and so took old man John, who was the last surviving disciple. Everybody else, uh, it's believed, was martyred. Uh, John was thrown in prison and sequestered on this island of Patmos. And it was on the island of Patmos that he had the revelation that he records for us. Um, in order to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand the Old Testament. There are some 404 or so verses in the book of Revelation and it contains about 800 allusions to the Old Testament. So unless you really understand the Old Testament, you have no hope of understanding the book of Revelation because it just draws on so much Old Testament. Um, also, one of the reasons it's important for us to study the book of Revelation uh, is not so that we'll know what's going to happen in the future necessarily or anything like that. Uh, but Revelation chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and who take it to heart what's written in it. And so I believe it's the only book in Scripture that contains within it a special blessing for those who study it. And so we'd be wise to study it. There's blessing contained in in the study of it. And so as we go through this, I want you to pay attention to your life and your family because accordingly, blessing will come as we study this book. I don't know what it'll look like. I don't know what it'll be, uh, but I believe it. And so we'll study it. So uh, let's jump in. There's a, there's a lot here and I don't know how much I'm going to get to on video. Um, in my live Bible study, we'll probably get to a lot more, but let me just, let me get through what we can. Uh, revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Right up front, chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a singular revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Who? Gave Jesus. So it's a revelation of Jesus to Jesus that he would then show his servants. Jesus is being unveiled to himself. Uh, God opens up to Jesus about himself. The Father opens up to the Son about the Son. Um, and, and he opens up to him about to show the servants what must soon take place. Now, when the Bible uses the word soon here, what it means is that once these things start, they'll happen rapidly. It doesn't necessarily mean soon since the writing of this is going to happen tomorrow, but it means that once it starts, it will pick up the pace. Uh, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. That word servant is a very particular word. Um, once one was in the service of a master, after six years, I believe it was the seventh year, they were supposed to set the servant free. Once the debt was paid, the servant could choose 
to continue serving the family and serving in the family home forever. If they deemed that service of the family and that particular master was better than living on their own, they could choose to serve that family forever. And as a sign of that commitment, um, that the servant was willing to stay, they would become what's called a bond servant. And a bond servant, you go back to Exodus 21, 6 and Deuteronomy 15, 17, and it talks about how the master of the home would take the, the ear of the bond, of the, who would be the bond servant, put it on the doorpost and pierce their ear with an owl. And so, and, and so this is, this is what John is saying. John is saying, the Bible is saying that John would rather be a willing servant of the master than be out on his own. He's willingly to serve the master for the rest of his life as a bond servant. So verse, this is, this is all just in verse one. In verse two, it says, who testifies everything he saw, <clears throat> that is the word of God and the testimony of Christ. Blessed is the one who, what, reads, so we got to read it, the words of this prophecy, bless those who hear it, means have some understanding of those who take it to heart, what's written here. And so that's kind of just the, the prologue and the introduction. Then we get into to the writing of it. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of earth. So it says grace and peace. Grace, that's that's what, that's what we talk a lot about here. Uh, the undeserved, unmerited favor and blessing. Grace and peace. Um, the balance of all things. The wholeness of all things. The shalom, the Old, Old Testament word shalom. Grace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. This is the eternal one. This is Jesus. And from the seven spirits before his throne. What are the seven spirits? Well, it means the sevenfold spirit. It means the Holy Spirit. So grace and peace to you from Christ and from the Holy Spirit. The sevenfold spirit. That means the complete spirit. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. That word ruler means the that's the millennial title that is yet to come. It's the ruler of the one who will reign in the millennium and in eternity. Now, right now, the devil's ruling things. The Bible's pretty clear about that. But there will come a time during the millennial reign of Christ and then for eternity when he will reign. This is the ruler he's talking about here. Uh, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This is just setting up who Jesus is because it is the revelation of him. Um, to him who loves us. That's a constant undying, unending love. And he has freed us, the Bible says, from our sins by his blood that was shed on the cross to be a whole new group of people, a kingdom of priests. To him be glory and power forever. Amen. This is like the triumph. This is like, this is, this is Jesus. Verse seven. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. And even those who pierced him, that's a hearkening back to Zechariah 12, 10, the one they have pierced. And all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. This is just setting up the entire, what is going to come here. And now Jesus speaks. This is, now Jesus speaks in verse eight. He says, I am the alpha and the omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and the Omega. This is the Lord God talking about this. Now, now look at what it says. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In Greek, this is significant. In Greek, the word Alpha is spelled out. 
But when it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Omega, that word is not spelled out as a word. It's just the letter Omega. Now, why wouldn't they spell out the word Omega? Why would they just leave it as the symbol of Omega? Well, many people suspect that the Alpha is spelled out because that's the beginning. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the end. A lot of people believe that Alpha is spelled out because the beginning is already completed. It's already taken place. But the end is not yet completed. The book of Revelation is about the end. And so the writer, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, just wrote the first war letter of the word Omega that was the symbol called Omega, indicating that the end has not yet come. So there was more to come. And this is God saying, I am the Alpha and I'm the Omega. I've already been. I'm, I, I am the beginning. The end is still coming. So pay attention. Pretty significant. So verse 9 now. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom, your brother in the, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of the God and the testimony of Jesus. Uh, Domitian, like I said, is the ruler. Uh, and, and towards the end of his reign, he really started persecuting the church. And so John says here, I'm, I'm, I'm your companion in the suffering that we're all going through right now. And I'm your companion in the kingdom. And I'm your companion with patient endurance. And I'm on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And so he says, verse 10, on the days, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet, which said, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. He says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. That means he was at church and he was worshiping. Revelation comes when we're in church worshiping. It just over and over you see it through scripture. And he's told, write this down to these seven churches. Verse 12 says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like, like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. Now, throughout the the, the, the text here, we're going to see this, the seven uh, stars and seven lampstands. I want us to understand right up front that when the book of Revelation talks about the lampstands, it's talking about churches. And when it talks about the stars, it's talking about the angels. So we're going to see seven stars and seven lampstands. It's the seven churches, the seven angels that are assigned to the seven churches that uh, that are being dressed here. So I turned around and saw the seven golden lampstands. That 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 is, I I saw the seven churches, and I saw among the lampstands someone like the Son of Man. It's kind of in quotes. What this tells us is that Jesus, the high priest, because he's wearing these these priestly robes, is in the midst of the churches. That Jesus is in, I, I still don't understand why people can say that they can, they can they can have a relationship with God and follow God apart from the local church. It's just not designed that way. And in the book of Revelation, we see Jesus, the great high priest, amongst where? The church is. Verse 14, his head and hair were like uh, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire now like just get this picture of jesus it's not this this tender little teddy bear that it just is my homeboy it's it's like there's have some respect and reverence for him man i mean he's dressed in this robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest his head and hair were white like wool as white as snow his eyes were like a blazing fire his feet were like bronze um glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters like this is not some meek and gentle little figure in his right hand he held seven stars remember the stars 
and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. <laughs> his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. So he's, he's amongst the churches with angels in his hand, and out of his mouth comes a sharp double-edged sword. This sword, the Bible talks about this type of sword. It's a short Roman sword, maybe 12 inches in length. Uh, and it's designed for close uh, personal combat. This isn't a big long spear. You reach out and touch somebody. This is this is a sword that was that was effective only after years of use and practice on how to wield it well. Um, and it's used in very close quarters. And it's the same word used by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians six seventeen that says, "Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God." So we're talking about Scripture here. Out of his mouth comes Scripture. And his face was like the shining sun, the sun shining in all its brilliance. I mean, this is not one to be trifled with. This is Jesus. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. If, if we think we can come before the presence of God, if we think we can come before Jesus and be comfortable, we are sorely mistaken in who Jesus is. John falls down dead. And then he says, he placed his right hand on me and said, what? Don't be afraid. This is the command of scripture over and over and over. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You got someone like this standing over you. It seems like you would be afraid. His word over and over. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's a command. It's also a promise because inherent in the command, don't be afraid, is the is the confirmation, the comfort, and the assurance of who it is that's saying, don't be afraid. This is a good God. It's a powerful God. Is a good God. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. I hold the keys of death. Death and Hades have no authority. Jesus has the authority. All uh, the Bible says, all authority in heaven, on earth, and under the earth has been given to Jesus. He holds the keys. Nothing happens that he doesn't know about, and that at some level he hasn't agreed to. He holds the keys. This this phrase where, where it says here, I am the first and the last, Isaiah 41, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 48, uh, Revelation 1, Revelation 2, Revelation 21, all throughout Scripture, this 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 phrase, I am the first and the last, is, is, is talked about in terms of Jesus. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and he holds all authority in his hand. This is an incredible God that we serve and that loves us. Verse 19, write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. He's saying, write what you've seen, the past, what is now, the present, and what will take place later, the future. This is an all-encompassing look. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars, the Bible says right here, are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so he says, I want you to write down what you've seen in the past, what is right now, and what is to come. This is the mystery of the angels of the churches. This is the mystery of the seven angels that are assigned to the seven churches that he'll be addressing in chapters 2 and 3. He says, you write this down. Because there's blessing for those who read this, who take it to heart, who believe it. These things will come. And there's great lessons for us in these things. That's all just the introduction to the book of Revelation. Now, as we study this, and I'm not going to go into chapter 2. I'm going to wait till next week because it, he starts giving instruction to, to these seven churches. And it is incredible and great, great lessons for us and warnings and promises. But as we read the book of Revelation, here's the thing. If you start reading this, usually when we read things, we read it linearly. Like it starts at this and it goes and it progresses and it ends here. The, the book of Revelation isn't like that in its totality. Like it will read linearly and then it will double back and circularly and then it will go linearly. And so it's it's a different type of writing. 
And so we can't read it beginning to end thinking this is all chronological in order and one follows the other necessarily because it, there will be some double back in it. So I just want to let you know about that ahead of time. Um, and so in this next couple of weeks, as we get into chapter two and chapter three, I encourage you to read those. Uh, read them through the lenses of not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well, because there's a lot of there's a lot of crossover and there's a lot of doubling back on what has already been written in Scripture. So uh, with that, I'm going to end um, and save chapter two and three for the next couple of weeks. But just understand that this is an incredible study. Um, it's not an easy study. Uh, and so pray for wisdom and revelation as we study revelation and pray that God will do exactly what he says and bless those who study this. Uh, and so keep an eye out for God's grace, his favor, his blessing on you, on your, on your family uh, and all the things that you put your hands to because that's who God is, this first and the last. This incredible man of power, this incredible God of authority. And it's this God that is for us, not against us. It's amazing. I'll see you at church.